welcome you guys. Saw the video that we're doing a Bible study tonight. Anybody? Or are you guys just scrolling through? I'm curious to see. Blessings, George. Can you guys hear my music too or no? You can't hear it. Hear my music? Is it super loud? Or is it okay? I thought only I could hear it. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Okay. Is that better? Can you, is my voice louder than the music now? I didn't know you can hear the music in the background. That's pretty cool. Well, tonight we are going to be um, doing a Bible study. And we're actually going to be talking about holiness. So I'm super excited for it. I hope you guys are excited too. So what I do ask from you is... Hey, hey. What I do ask from you... Wait, is this... What I do ask from you is that you grab your Bible, grab a notebook, uh, grab a pen, so we can really dive into this. Um, the goal of this Bible study is for you to encounter God during this time um, and really just have any blinders that have been blinding you to holiness or to what holiness is or keeping you away from God because of holiness or the lack of that that ends today okay Jesse you're not the only one who thinks that it's hard to read the Bible so I declare that tonight that's gonna break and you're gonna as we go through the Bible study you're gonna be able to understand it more and be able to um get into it more you know a lot of the times when we don't understand scripture or where it becomes difficult for us is because we're trying to understand it in our own mind and yes part part of it can be you know studied educationally academically and and whatnot but but the but this is like scripture is god breathe it's a it's a holy thing it's something that is alive and we need the help of Holy Spirit to be able to understand it many times. So, you know, when we go to scripture, we ask the Lord in prayer, like, help me to understand what I'm reading, you know, um, and even just getting together with other people to really learn about scripture is really important. You don't have to do it on your own. Okay, first and foremost, grab your Bible. Um... Is the music okay? Is it too loud? Should I turn it off? Is it distracting? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments before we get started. No, it's good. Thank you, George. You've been faithful through ever since we started, like two minutes ago. Okay. Um, I, I'm just going to hold on, okay? It's actually distracting to me. So um, go ahead and grab your Bible. Once your Bible, once you're ready with your Bible and your notebook, put in the comments. I'm ready. 
Once you're ready with your Bible and your notebook, put in the comments, I'm ready. And while you do that, I'm going to just go ahead and pray us in, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, God. Thank you that you have set it apart, that you have already... Um, this, that this, this was a divine appointment for each and every individual on the other side of this screen, God. That there is no coincidence in you, Lord. That although the person probably thought they were just scrolling by, Lord, I just thank you because this was a divine appointment for them. Thank you that you are going to be reaching hearts tonight, Lord. Thank you that people are going to be encountering you, God. They've all come to hear you, not me, Lord. So we, we pray that... You just speak through me, Lord, that it may not be my words, my opinions, my my thoughts, but it may all be you, God. We just declare that after this Bible study, there will be your people that will be walking in holiness, that will actually desire to walk in holiness, God, that they will no longer be um, swayed with the world. They will no longer feel like, um, they, they have to belong into the world, Lord, but that they will actually be proud to be holy, to be set apart for your glory, Lord. And we just ask that you speak, Lord, your servants are listening in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So if you're ready, let me know in the comments. I'm ready. If you got your Bible, if you got your notebook, let me know in the comments that you're ready so we can get started. Because I'm not going to be the only one going through this, you guys. We're going to do this together. Hey, Catherine. I haven't seen anyone say I'm ready. So I'm assuming nobody's got their Bible open. And nobody's got their notebooks yet. So uh, we're going to be reading off of Philippians. We're going to start with Philippians 3. Hold on, hold on. All right. Thank you, Catherine. We got one faithful. Hey, you're gonna get at, you're going to get from this what you put into it. You know what I mean? George, all right, I see you. Anybody else ready? Anybody else ready? Get your Bible, get your notebook. This is not the live where you come to see me and hear me only. This is not it. Go ahead and scroll by if you think that is. <laughs> all right, we're gonna be out of we're gonna be reading out of Philippians 3. Again, this conversation is gonna be on holiness. Okay, so I'm reading out of the new international version. I think that's what it stands for, NIV. But I'm also going to have NLT on the side. I don't know what they stand for. New, I don't know. But NIV, NLT. But I'm going to be reading out of NIV and then sometimes referring to NLT. Okay, just so you guys know right now, because mostly you guys always ask, what are you reading out of the Bible? Okay, so a Philippians 3, we're going to start at 8, and we're going to jump around to different scriptures, but as we read, we're going to break them down, and I'm going to kind of pause and go, thank you, Sai. Um, I'm going to pause and go as, as we read. Again, the conversation is on holiness, okay? Okay. Um, yeah, Lord, come and have your way. Philippians 3, 8 to 21. Let's go to 7. Uh, 3, 7. Philippians 3, 7 through 21. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Also, if you feel like, wait, I'm getting lost just hang in there. I promise you it's going to make sense. It's going to make sense. And um, ask questions as you read. The way I learn is when I ask questions, like sometimes I'll write them down and I'm like, wait, why does it say this? And then I'll research it later or scripture will reveal it later on. So this is Paul speaking to the church of Philippi. And Paul writing to the church of Philippi. But whatever were gains to me, now I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. 
I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having, okay, and be found in him, pause. So Paul is saying, whatever I had, it means nothing. Christ is everything. I would lose everything and have lost everything for the sake of Christ. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. Now we're going to transition to the second part, which is really interesting. And we're going to pause after this. He says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. So he's saying, he's saying basically righteousness that comes from the law refers to you're made righteous or made whole or justified in the sight of Christ. Like you're, you're per, um, perfect essentially, or you're made right by the way you were made right back in the day was by following the law, right? If you followed the 10 commandments and you followed the Jewish law, um, and they had a whole bunch of laws, then by following that you were technically made righteous, which means that you were in right standing with God. But he's saying here, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So we know as Christians that the law was fulfilled, right? The law was fulfilled when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. So in order to become righteous now, in order to become in right standing because we were born into sin, right? We don't, just when we're born as babies, we don't automatically become Christians. We don't automatically receive um, salvation. It's something we have to choose. And it's saying here, Paul is saying here that having righteousness on the basis of faith means being righteous, being made whole through faith, which is in believing in Christ Jesus, believing that he died on the cross for our sins, believing that we are made right in the sight of God because of Jesus, right? So he's no longer, Paul is no longer identifying with the law. He's no longer finding his righteousness and his being made right in front of God with the law, but now with Jesus, through the faith in Jesus, we're in Philippians 3.10 now. I want to know Christ. Yes. To know the power. Underline that word if you were reading your Bible, which I hope you are. Or write it down. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Because like him in his death and so somehow attaining and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I, underline that, but I press on, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have yet been taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, underline this whole part, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. That is very practical. Paul is saying what was back there, what I did back then before Christ, even though it was righteous acts, everything I did back then, I, I forget it. I press forward now. I'm going forward to what is ahead. I'm going for, forward from what I did back then. And my question to you tonight, and I'm going to be bringing it up because it's about holiness, is have you forgotten what you were like? Have you forgotten what you did? Have you been pressing forward after Christ? Or does your past look like where you're at now, after Christ? Are you doing the same things? Are you hanging around the same people? Do you have the same thoughts? Are you pressing 
towards what is ahead, like Paul says. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on towards the goal. Check this out. I press on towards the goal to win the prize. Underline, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Isn't it interesting here that Paul says to, he presses forward towards the goal to win the prize. The prize here is salvation and eternal life with God. It's interesting that he says, though, that he presses forward towards that goal. He presses forward to win the prize. We all know that Christ has given us the gift of salvation. It's a gift given to us. It's up to us to accept it. But did you know that it doesn't end at exception? Your salvation and eternal life that is to come in, in the presence of God doesn't end just as, at, as, at, at acceptance. You got to continue going forward. You got to press for that. You got to go towards what's ahead. Because if you just say yes, but nothing in your life indicates that you've said yes, you got some questioning to do within yourself. If you want to pursue a relationship and you say yes to that partner and you say, yeah, I want to be in a, in a relationship with you. But you never talk to them. You never text them. You never call them. You never hang out. But you're like, but I say yes. And you expect to have the same benefits of being in a relationship. Something's wrong. Something is not right there. Some, there's some digging you got to do. Did you really say yes? And maybe you did say yes. Maybe you were, you meant it with all of your heart, but there was no follow through to that relationship. Do you think that person's going to want to stay with you? Probably not. If they're in their right mind. So we got to think about that. Holiness. That's the conversation tonight. Holiness. Now we're going to jump to Philippians 4. Eight through nine. Welcome to all the new people who are coming on here. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. You shall know them by their fruit. You need to adopt the characteristics of the Lord. Amen, Catherine. Now we're moving on to Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, before I start, some of you might ask, well, and, and some of you might even think, well, it doesn't take all that. It doesn't take all that to be a Christ follower. It doesn't take all that to be Christian. It doesn't take all that. And although it doesn't take anything for you to come to Christ and accept him, like come as you are. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you have, that's the reason we come to Christ because we need him. If you're dealing with homosexuality, if you're dealing with anger, if you're dealing with lust, if you're dealing with pornography, if you're dealing with, you know, masturbation, if you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with, he's like, yeah, come to me. We got to recognize that we, we are in need of a savior first and foremost, whatever you're dealing with, he's not having you. He's not asking you to change before you come to him. He's saying, come as you are. Come as you are. And when you do come to him, though, because you understand you need him, when, let me rephrase that, when you understand you need him, usually what follows after that is true repentance. Usually what follows after that is that real desire to have a relationship with him. Now, many people want to know about God and want to have the feeling of, oh yeah, you know, God is my homeboy or, you know, God knows me. I always talk to him and, 
you know, um, I grew up going to church and um, things like, oh, yeah, you know, they, they people want to be associated with God, but they don't really want to do the, the hard work. They don't really want to do what the Bible talks about as like the plowing, right? They don't really want to do the planting. They don't really want to do the harvesting. It's just of they want to be associated with God because they know blessings come from God and that's what I'm here for. You know what I mean? But God is more than that, you guys. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to whoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Gave his one and only son to come and die on the cross for our sins. So when we recognize that we need a savior, we recognize that we're wrong. And that's what's happening and holding a lot of people up in this generation is that we don't recognize that we're wrong. We don't recognize that we need a savior. We just want to be associated with God. We don't recognize that there's anything wrong with us. What? Something's wrong with me? No way. This is how I was born. This is how I was made. There is nothing wrong with me. Truth be told, though, we were born into sin. And there is always something wrong with us when we are born into sin. But when we recognize that we need our Lord and Savior, we need God. We need God in our lives. That's when we leave space for change. That's when we leave space for God to sanctify us and be made holy right? Transparency is required. Amen. So let's go now to Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Okay, well, how can I start this holiness walk? Like what's a practical way? This is a great, these are a great couple of verses that will help you start. And, and even when you want to check, like, is this holy or not? This is a great place to go to. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. There is no coincidence why Paul says, put it into practice. And then he says, and the God of peace will be with you. Obedience, thinking purity, thinking um, lovely thoughts, think, thinking about whatever is admirable, true, excellent, praiseworthy, all of that holiness and God come together. You cannot separate God from holiness or holiness from God. Wherever there's holiness, God is there. The absence of holiness means God is not there. And many of us are walking, going into churches, doing Bible studies, going to Bible studies, having Christian friends, and living a life that is not holy. But we think because we're doing all these outside things, because we're going to church, because we're being around these Christian friends, because we're going to Bible studies, but not living a holy life that Christ is with us. But he's not. You can't separate God from holiness, which means the absence of Holiness means there is no God. Does that make sense? Now, God is a God that is omnipresent, right? Omnipresent. So we know he is everywhere. He can be everywhere and anywhere. So when there's something bad happening, of course, he can be there and rescue a person or he can take you out of the darkest places. Yes, even when you're being unholy, yes and amen. But when we are striving to have a relationship with God, we should be striving and pushing forward, like Paul said, towards that goal. 
and not for the sake of us, although, I mean, partially, yeah, for the sake of us, you know, for eternity, but also for the sake of those around us, those who see us, those who need that hope, those who need that peace that they can't find in the world, those who need to look up to someone or look, you know, find and not really look up to someone because it does, it's not about us, but look, basically find something that they can't find in the world. But if we look like the world, what hope do people have to look into or look for? We look like everyone else. We act like everyone else. Right? Let's move on. If you are still here and reading with me, put it in the comments. I'm here. Let me see. I want to see it. Put it in the comments. I'm here. Okay, Rob, I see you. George, I see you. Uh, we are turning um, presente, Catherine. Okay, Spanish. We're turning to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Amen, Jose. Colossians 1. Again, the conversation tonight, if you're just joining, is on holiness. Colossians 1. And we're going to be reading 9 through 14. Okay? Colossians, it's the, it's the book right after Philippians. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. This is, I love this topic. Okay, here we go. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that, so that, how do you obtain it? First, okay, let me just go. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Live so that you may live a life. That means it takes, it takes some action from you. It takes some, you know, you got to do something. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Why would, why would Paul be saying, live a life worthy of the Lord? I thought we just say yes to God and we can do whatever and live however. I mean, that's what's being taught off of the pulpits. We need to live a life that is worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing, how do we please him? Bearing fruit. In every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great, so that you may have great endurance ooh, and patience and giving joyful thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Let us back up because there is so much in all of this. Jeez. First and foremost, we'll back up to the beginning. Colossians 1. Uh, sorry, Colossians 9. Where it's, I mean, it's saying all these good things like, you know. But how do we obtain it? If we go back to Colossians 9, towards the middle, we'll see it. We continually ask God to fill you with his knowledge. So being filled by the knowledge of God. Praying for the knowledge of God. And his will through all of the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives. Praying for the knowledge of God. Praying for his will. And praying for all the knowledge. All the wisdom that the spirit gives. Those three things are key in this passage. How do you obtain these, this walk of holiness? How do you obtain making good decisions? Discerning what is right from wrong? Um, bearing good fruit? How do you obtain that? Through the filling of God of his knowledge, through the wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives. Wisdom and understanding. So when you pray, 
if you don't have a fancy prayer and you don't know what to pray for in the morning, like just pray, God, fill me with your knowledge. Holy Spirit, guide me in your wisdom and understanding. Okay? So it says here, um, it says here, fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wis through all the wisdom and understanding of the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of God. How do you get that life worthy of God again? How do you please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work is by again, going back to the beginning, what we just said, asking the Lord to fill you with his knowledge and the spirit to give you the wisdom and understanding. Growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened. So that strengthens you with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance. This is key right here. Underline that. How do you get great endurance? How do you continue to be a Christian in a world that is dark? How do you keep going? Oh, thanks for my crown. How do you keep going? By praying that prayer. By saying, Lord, fill me with your knowledge. Holy Spirit, give me that wisdom and understanding. That is how. Thank you so much, George. That is how, that is how we gain that strength, that momentum, that endurance by doing, you know, what is good, what is holy by, by bearing good fruit. See, it's like the gym y'all. And I haven't been there in a bit. Okay. But I know how it works, but it's like the gym. When you start seeing like, when you start seeing results, all of a sudden that person who was like, uh, like the old you who is like, uh, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to wake up. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. When you start seeing results, you're like, okay, okay. I like this. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep putting in my time, putting in my, you know, my hour, whatever. I'm going to keep eating right. I'm going to keep doing this, this and that because you see results that produces endurance, that produces motivation, that produces in you the longevity to keep going. That is what Paul is saying. That doing all these good deeds, walking a holy life, pleasing to God gives you endurance to keep going because you start seeing the hand of God in your life. You start seeing how God moves mountains around you, how God heals people around you. You start walking in the power and the knowledge, the, dis the discernment that Holy Spirit gives you. You start seeing the good fruits. You start seeing everything that your life is producing and not only you, but those around you. You're like, okay, this is real. Your faith starts being built up. Your faith starts getting fortified, may be made stronger because you start seeing results and you only get those results by walking a holy life, by walking that set apart life. And you may say, oh yeah, well, why would God only, you know, why would you only, why would you have to do something in order for him to give something to you? Like he doesn't work like that. Like, you know, he, 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 he doesn't work like that. And okay, God can bless everyone and anyone. He could do whatever he wants. But if scripture is given us a principle that says walking a holy life leads to X, Y, and Z, why not follow it? Why not take a for sure than just like rolling the dice? God, are you going to bless me today? Are you going to, you know, do something in my life today? Are you going to answer my prayer? Like, if we got a principle here, why not follow it? And I was going to say something else about that, but I can't think about it right now. So I guess it must not be that important. All right. Did we read all the way up to 14? Okay, almost. So let's go 12. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Do you guys understand that? That we were 
originally before Jesus came, because of Adam and Eve's sin, we were doomed to spend eternity without God. We were doomed in this earth to be enslaved to our sin. Do you know what that looks like? Think about that family member. Think about that friend whom go, who goes through addiction, who goes through, who maybe is like, who has a hard, hard life because they keep making the wrong choices. They keep getting into trouble and doing the same thing over and over again. And doesn't matter what they do, they can't seem to get out of it. Let that be a picture to what being enslaved looks like. What once we were once enslaved to sin, that means that we didn't have a choice if we wanted to sin or not. We were doomed to just be sinners and, and be separated from the presence of God in eternity. But Jesus came to die for our sins, not only to die for them, but to give us the power that is over sin, where we no longer have to participate in those things and be enslaved to them. We have a choice if we want to be bound or if we don't. And so for God, for it to say he rescued us from the dominion, something that was over us, dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Amen to that. Let's move on to Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. We're talking about holiness if you are just joining in. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Here we go. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. What does that mean? So we hear, you know, if, if you're new in, in your Christian walk, if you're still a baby in your Christian walk, you know, you might hear like, oh, you died with Christ, you know, and you're like, okay, what does that even mean? Like, what you mean I died with Christ? I'm still here. Like, <laughs> you know? And it's basically like um, symbolically speaking, but not really symbolically speaking because you're actually supposed to die with Christ, like not live, not resurrect things, you know, that were supposed to be dead. So it means that you set, like once you come, once you came to know Christ, you, uh, the old you died. The old you no longer exists. The old you, the old you know, uh, sins that you were bound to, the old, you know, everything, thoughts that you had, like all those things. When you came to Christ, you said, I'm done. And that's, that's another thing that we're doing is I, I see a lot of people come to God, but not with the desire. Again, and it comes to recognizing when you don't recognize that you need a savior, you don't really desire to change because you're like, everything's cool with me. But a lot of people come to Christ with just like just wanting to accept them and not let go of their past or let go of who they are, you know, and I, I know sometimes change takes time and sanctification is a, a process that we will forever be living in. But I know that I'm not where I used to be, you know what I mean? And there should be that you should be able to see how you've been progressing throughout your Christian walk. And if you don't see that, you need to make, you need to have, make low inventory check on why. And don't feel bad. The last thing I want you to feel here is condemnation. God doesn't condemn anyone. But if Holy Spirit is speaking to you that you're acting the same, that you're doing the same thing, you're talking the same way, you're thinking the same thoughts from before you knew Christ, don't let it feel like, oh my gosh, I am the worst person in the world and God doesn't love me. No. 
what's happening right now and why you're feeling maybe like, you know, conviction about it. Like, yeah, you're right. Is actually the mercy of God. It's God's mercy revealing it to you, revealing those things to you and saying, hey, this is it right here. This is what needs to change. And I want to do this with you. So don't let the enemy lie to you and say, oh, see, you're not even good enough to be a Christian. Mm-mm. Devil, you need to be quiet because that is not what hap- what's happening here. God's mercy is being shown to his people right now. And I declare that, that you will receive God's mercy and is at it as it, it is being shown to you right now, that you will not feel condemned, but you will feel a conviction. But you will understand that it's God's mercy and you will accept the call. All right. So where were we? Uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Uh, yeah. So being raised with Christ, meaning that, you know, it, it, it if the old you died and you're raised with Christ, that means you're living like Christ, right? And obviously we're not perfect in the sense that we live just like Christ, which again, sanctification is a long, like it's a whole wor- whole life thing, but you should be striving to live like Christ, right? And so if we are raised with Christ and we're still doing the things that we did when we were before Christ, that means those things actually haven't died, right? And we need, we need to make sure they, they die. So set your hearts on things above. This is practical advice. How do you act like you're raised with Christ? How do you walk a holy life? Set your heart on things above, meaning on things that matter, on, on, on truths of scripture on who God is on who God created you to be on your identity in Christ set your hearts on things above and interestingly enough scripture often interchanges hearts and minds um there's many scriptures where the heart is the mind and the mind is the heart in scripture right so set your heart on things above where Christ is seated seated at the right hand of god set your mind on things above not on earthly things for you have died and your life is now hidden with christ in god when christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory there was a good scripture that the pastor covered tonight um, let me just read that. It goes with this one. Let me see if I can find it. Um. Ah, so I just said right now, uh, Colossians 3, I said, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above not earthly things. Ephesians 1, 20 to 21 says, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the age, but also in which is to come. We have to remember that we are seated in heavenly places with God as well. So our mind should always be, even though it's difficult because we live in this world, but our mind should always be with Christ. If our mind is with Christ, we start thinking Christ's thoughts. We start understanding that if he's over principalities of darkness, if he's over sickness, if he's over addictions, if he's over all of these things, so am I because I am seated with him, right? Um, let's keep going for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. What is that? What, what is, what is he talking about? Let's keep reading. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, 
evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Why is the wrath of God coming? Because of what we just listed. And let me list it again. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. So if we are operating in those things, the wrath of God is coming. We are not to operate in those things. Or else the wrath of God is for us too. And we know that scripture says that the wrath of God is not for his people. But if you are operating in those things, I will take, again, inventory check. Am I, am I actually, did, Am I actually walking with God? Did I recognize that I needed saving? Did I recognize that there is something wrong with me? That I need the Lord to sanctify me, make me whole, right? Verse 7 says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as this. So Paul is saying, recognize, you used to walk in these things, but now it's not no more. And you need to rid yourself of these things. What things are those? Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its present practices. If you have not taken off your old self, you still are practicing all of these things listed. So you have taken off your old self with these practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. So stop there. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. What does that mean? The only time renewal comes The only time that sanctification comes is when you put on the new self. But in order to put on the new self, you got to let go of the old self. So nothing is renewed. Your mind is not renewed. Your actions are not renewed. You haven't entered the sanctification process unless you have taken off the old self and put on the new self. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And we're going to jump to 12 where it says, therefore, as God's chosen people, listen to this. It's not saying therefore, as you know, those who go to church It's not saying therefore, those who, you know, answered an altar call someday. It says, therefore, as God's meaning If you are God's chosen people, this is how you will be identified. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself. Holy and dearly loved. Holy as God's chosen people. Holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have has a grievance against someone forgive as the lord forgave you and over all of these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity let the peace of god is really interesting that this comes after all of those good fruits, right? All of those good fruits. Let the peace of God, just like we read before, let the peace of God, of Christ, rule in your hearts since as members of one body, remember that, we're gonna come back to that later, but let the peace of God rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let this message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, 
whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, remember that whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. If you're doing something, this is a good checkpoint for if you're about to do something, if you can say, I'm going to do this in the name of God, giving thanks. I'm going to do this in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. If you can say that after what your decision you chose to make, cool. But if it feels weird and it's like, um, yeah, that don't really go together. Like if I do this, I can't say I'm doing this, you know, in the name of the Lord Jesus, because I'm about to watch something I shouldn't watch. So yeah, that's kind of weird. Maybe I shouldn't watch it. <laughs> so if you can put this, if you can put this as a tagline on every after every decision you're going to make, if you can put... You know, I'm going to do this in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Then cool, you walking right. But if you can't, think about that decision before you do it. Let's move forward to 1 Thessalonians. It's after Colossians. So 1 Thessalonians 1. If you're still with me, say, I'm here. And if you're just joining, we are studying about holiness, talking about holiness. That's our conversation tonight. Catherine is here dancing away. Rob, George, Carmen. What's up, Carmen? Mel Melena. Hi. Now we are in 1 Thessalonians 1. And we're going to read 3 to 12. Okay. 3 to 12. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. Listen to that. The gospel of Christ is not only words, but it is power, y'all. Don't forget that. With the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. That's also very important. You know that we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Wait, am I reading the right thing? Yeah. Uh, actually, let's jump to um, the middle of verse 8. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about... Uh, sorry, let's read verse 9. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols... They tell how you turn to God from idols. Many of us turn to God with our idols. Can I hear a hallelujah? Amen. That's true. Say it. They tell how, they t how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rec rescued us from the coming wrath. We're going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 23. All right. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure 
that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God, God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just when you accept the Lord as your Savior, but may be kept until the coming of Jesus Christ. I think that I might have skipped one that I wanted to read. Did I not write it down? Mm. Oh, I don't think I've read this. This was supposed to be the first one. I might have. But let's just go back. If I did, I'm sorry. But let's just go back real quick. Philippians 3, 8. No, Philippians 3, 15. We're going to read 15 to 21. Philippians 3, 15 to 21. Okay. Go back a few pages. Philippians 3, 15 to 21. All of us then who are mature should take such view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Praise the Lord. So Paul is talking about, again, being holy and um, oh yeah, I didn't I didn't go on. I just stopped that to press forward towards the goal. So he's talking about being holy, you know, walking with each other and doing all that. And he's saying, you know, we should all be mature to do that. But I love how he says, but if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. This is your that too. If you're not living a holy life right now, God is making it clear to you. And he's showing you, it's time to be mature about your walk with the Lord. It's time to take holiness seriously. Verse 16 says, only let us live to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. What does that mean? I was reading a commentary that like, what is enemies of the cross of Christ? And what does that mean exactly? And I loved how, how David Guzik said this. I think that's how you say his last name. The enemies of the cross were really the opposite of the legalists who celebrated their supposed liberty in Christ to indulge their flesh. So essentially, enemies of the cross, they just gave in to all of their desires, right? And enemies of the cross equals like didn't, didn't walk or believe in the biblical truth of what the cross stood for, which and what it carried, which was power and righteousness. The cross carries so much power and shows us that we're no longer bound to sin, which means that we, through the cross, we can be changed, you know, and, and we don't have to indulge in all of these things. And so here it says, um, here it says, I tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. I like the way NLT says that. Um, the NLT version says, um, 
for I have told you, no, 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 they are all, um, sorry, 18, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many who conduct show, who, whose conduct, wait, that there are many whose conduct shows, whose conduct shows, there are many whose conduct, whose actions, whose fruits shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. So it doesn't say that they are already in destruction. It doesn't say that they are already, you know, their life is doomed. But it is saying that a certain conduct, a certain um, unholy living actually is because they're living in that manner. They're headed towards destruction. And their God is their stomach. What does that mean? Their stomach means basically that they're living, again, they're living to please their bodies. They're living to pleasure their bodies, their mind, their soul. So when it says their God is their stomach, that's what it means. And their glory is their shame. Isn't that interesting? Oh, Lord. In the world that we live in now, We have found glory in our shame. There are things that we struggled with that we have at one point we felt shameful for because basically God created us in his image. So we know what is right and wrong. And there are things that we did, you know, whether it's masturbation, whether it's viewing pornography, whether it's you know, sleeping with the same sex or being attracted, not being attracted, but sleeping with the same sex or living with the same sex or whatever. And at one point we felt it to be, to be shameful. And now we glory in it. Now we find power in it. For example, you know, at one point, maybe as a woman, we, we felt shameful to like expose all of our body parts or, you know, sleep with someone um, or whatever. And now we find it as empowerment. Now we're like, it's just, it means we're liberating ourselves. But that's not what it means. We're finding glory in our shame. And that is what Paul is talking about here. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship, listen to this, our citizenship is in heaven. When you are a citizen of some place, <laughs> being a citizen, I live in the United States. So being a citizen of the United States comes with a lot of perks, right? Okay. So it comes with a lot of perks. Being a citizen of Canada comes with its perks. Being a citizen of Australia comes it with its perks. Being a citizen of Mexico, being a citizen of whatever you're at comes with its perks. Your your not being a citizen not only comes with perks, but you're a part of that government, right? You're ruled by that government. Let me say it that way. Whatever goes in that government, like your, your, your dominion, that government is your dominion, right? Like you're under it. So when you're a citizen of heaven, though, if you're a citizen of heaven, we function as citizens of heaven. There is no lust. There is no anger there is no um anxiety there is no fornication there is none of that in heaven so why are we living like citizens of the earth with a passport from heaven with the citizenship from heaven we are governed by the government of heaven we are governed by Christ and we're living in the means like we're governed by this government of this earth. And yet to an extent, we have to follow rules. Obviously, I'm not saying that, but we are not enslaved to them. We don't make our decisions based on what they say when it comes to spiritual things, right? So we're holding a citizenship of heaven, but we are acting like our citizenship is from earth. We're thinking about things that are fleeting. We're, our mind is set on things of this earth. We even forgot that we have a citizenship in heaven. 
because we're so focused on what we're doing here, right? We have to walk with authority, boldness, and confidence. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That's beautiful. We're almost done. Uh, we are now going to go to Philippians 1, 27. I want to read something that is very interesting. I don't know about you, but I grew up in the church. I didn't choose to follow Christ for myself until I was about like 16. Um... And I've always heard about division in the church. I've always heard about, you know, there's this, this denomination believes this, this believes that, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm truly one who, like, I know hate is a strong word, but hates seeing the division in the church. Because I'm like, yo, can we get over these things and focus on biblical core matters and understand that we can, if we have to agree on these things, if we agree on these core things, everything else is whatever. Doesn't matter. Okay. Now, it's interesting because as I was reading Philippians, I came across something that I was like, hmm, that's very interesting. I wrote this little note that says, um, well, let's read it first. Philippians 1 27 says this. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then, whether I come to see you or only to hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith, for the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Let me read that again. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a matter, manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then when it, whether I come to see you or I hear or I hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. And this is these are a couple notes that I wrote. Standing in one spirit. Standing in unity, I always thought about it as like, oh, in order for us to stand in unity, it means like we have to agree on everything. Like we have to come into agreement and be like, okay, y'all get this, y'all get this. Do we all get this? Okay, this is what it is. Do we stand on it? Cool. All right, then we are one body. But I'm now realizing that standing in one spirit Standing in unity actually comes down to holiness. Comes down to our conduct. If we stand in holiness as, as believers in different denominations, if we stand as holy people, we stand as one. Aside from our not even taking into account theological differences, right? How can we work on being united in one mind? Philippians 2, 2, 2 to 4 says this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value each other above your value others above yourself not looking at your own interests but each of you in the interest of others it comes down to conduct comes down to holiness unity in the body of christ comes down to holiness here is a whole here's another note i wrote 
we're focused too much on what unity looks like to us as the body we focus too much on the differences of theology and and we realize oh my gosh we're like because we're not united in this we're like super divided and we forget about how the people out there who are not in the church look at us you think they know about all the theological differences the way we do no what they see though is because we are thinking it's about the theological difference when it's actually about God calling us to holiness is what brings us in unity because we have we we our mind is on the wrong thing we look like chaos to the outside world we look divided to the outside world but imagine if the body of Christ walked in holiness to the outside world they'll be like wait they are united. God is so good. Think about this. Pe- I know some people, I know y'all probably heard, what type of Christian are you? Because people from the outside world see different types of Christians. What do I mean by that? Christians that party, Christians that only go to church, Christians that still drink, Christians that don't drink, Christians that believe in deliverance, Christians that don't, Christians that... Um, you know, still smoke, Christians that don't, Christians that can be gay, Christians that can't. That's what the outside world is looking at. And it comes down to us not walking in holiness. Holiness is what unites the body of Christ. That's how we become one. If we all walk in holiness, the outside world will view us as one. We will understand that we are one because we are striving to be holy. And let me, let me end with this. We're going to turn to Acts 2. Love going to this. Love it. Because this always just brings everything together. Um, amen. And I pray that the Lord will echo this to pastors and, 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 and speakers out there that they recognize. I just declare right now that other speakers, that Holy Spirit, you will just echo this to other speakers and pastors and and preachers that they will recognize that holiness is where unity is found. That it is not about theological differences or sameness, but if we walk in holiness, we walk in unity. All right, let's let's look let's look at what that looks like in 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 um in the flesh. <laughs> Acts 2 42 through 47 i love going to this because it's like this is what the this is what the body of christ should look like in the church they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to breaking of bread and to prayer i don't know about y'all but that sounds super holy right that sounds like they're bearing good fruits because you know they're devoting themselves to the teaching and to fellowship which means coming together um you know eating together and praying together I don't know about you, but when you're in an atmosphere where it's all good fruits, all good things happen in the atmosphere, it's really hard to do wrong. And that's what you want to be in. Okay. 43 says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another who had a need. That's big right there. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Let me, this is where I want to point out right here, the end. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Holiness produces good fruits. Walking in holiness, it produces good fruits. It helps us to make good decisions, to put others before ourselves. Holiness produces 
good fruits. If we walk in holiness, we make good decisions, we gain favor with people. Not only that, but the Lord adds to our numbers of those who are being saved. Many of us in church, we are stuck on, and I would say specifically leaders, you know, are stuck on, and not only pastors, but leadership are stuck on, we need to get more numbers. How can we get more people to come into this church? How can we get more to, to join us and to, you know, maybe they want to save and to be saved. Maybe that's really their heart. But if we followed Acts 2 and we observe, we realize that they didn't do anything to go out there to get people to come in, to join them. They did the opposite. They actually isolated themselves in one place where they they fellowshiped together, they broke bread together, they ate together, they met each other's needs. And because they were so faithful with that, because they were so faithful with their holiness, with the way they walked, with the way that they glorified God through their works, God added to them the number of people that were being saved. Goes back to if you're faithful with the little Being faithful with the little is important because God will give you more. Amen. That's all I got for today, y'all. That's all I got for today. Let me know in the comments if this blessed you. I pray that this is just the beginning for you. That holiness will be a continual thing that you will want to um, practice. You know? Amen. Yes. Praise God. God is so good, you guys. God is so good. Even when we fail him, he is still good. Yes, Sierra. Let's go ahead and pray for Sierra, you guys. For her Sierra's boyfriend, Michael. God, we just put Michael in your hands right now, God. Your word says, as we just read, that we should be putting away anger when we come to you, Lord. That that should be the old self that died. And God, I don't know if Michael knows you or not, God, but if he doesn't, I pray that you open his spiritual eyes and ears right now in the name of Jesus, wherever he may be that he will come to know you as his Lord and Savior, that he will choose to follow you, God, that he will choose to walk a holy life, Lord, and in return, that he will be able to rid that anger because of the power of the cross, because of the power of Holy Spirit within him. In Jesus' name, I pray that you protect any seed of the gospel that comes into his life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Catherine. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, we just declare complete healing over George right now, over his body. Uh, We call out to his body right now. Be aligned with the good and perfect will of the Father and be made whole right now in Jesus' name. That when you wake up, you will no longer have a cold in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, y'all. This is such a blessing. Um, I just, I hope you really were able to encounter the Lord tonight and able to hear his heart. And remember, I just want to make sure you remember this. If at whatever point during this conversation you felt guilt or shame or condemnation, remember that God doesn't, God doesn't come at us like that. Remember that that's the enemy and what God is actually doing is his mercy is showing for you and he's wanting to partner up with you and he's saying, hey, these are the areas that need to change and I want to partner up with you. I want to sanctify you, but I need you to be obedient and say yes. So I pray you listen to the voice of God. I pray that you listen to to his voice as as he has mercy over you. Hey, Glow. Yeah, I totally get that. You know, I'm going to just be honest with you. You will never find a perfect church, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, 
That's why it's so important to get into your word yourself. What happens is most of the times we look for this perfect church. We try to look for this perfect place that we can go worship because we lack, and don't take this the wrong way, okay? I don't know you, but we lack our personal time with the Lord. We lack our encounters with God. So we're hoping to make up for that by looking for a perfect church who doesn't focus on wrong things. But when we have those daily encounters with the Lord, when we get into his word and start learning and be being um, intentional about being with him and learning about him, the church and how it looks and what they focus on um, and maybe our preferences are not as highlighted. They're not as like prominent. We start to be like, oh, I mean, yeah, this church is not perfect. And there's a couple of things here and there. But other than that, like if I'm getting my word in and I'm getting all this, the church is really to just come together and fellowship and be with like-minded people. It doesn't, you know, unfortunately, it's not going to be perfect. You know what I mean? So, but that's not to say you shouldn't test the spirits. Right, you should definitely ask the Lord which church is for you, um, but don't go to visiting a church with the hopes that you will get filled by the church because that only happens with God and in your alone time with the Lord. Hopefully, that helps. Rob, <laughs> well. It depends. I'm a very like upfront person. Like I just need to know what to do type of thing. And I'll give you a few different places. So if you want to learn, like if you've been walking with the Lord for a while now and you're still living the same lifestyle, I would say start in Philippians. Um, honestly, I've been, I've been like stuck on Philippians for a while because I'm like, there's so much here. I just want to learn more and more. But start with Philippians and read through there because it's going to teach you a lot about how we should be growing and how we should be holy, just like we were reading. If you're looking to just know more about God, about Jesus, about his like his journey here and more of the historical aspect of things, start in the um, start in uh, Matthew. And you'll find, you know, they're similar stories. I, I, I'm trying to think about how you say it in English. Mateo, Marcos, Lucas, Juan. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> so you can, you, those are very similar stories, but there's a few differences. Um, if you're looking to gain wisdom, if you're really looking for wisdom from God in these moments, I would say go to Proverbs. If you're looking for comfort, like if you're really wanting comfort from God right now, read Psalms. Um, there's a lot in Psalms that David was so raw and real with God about how he felt. But the beautiful structure that I see in the Psalms of David, which I love, is that he didn't deconstruct no matter how he felt. He didn't deconstruct his faith. What he did is he 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 voiced everything that he felt, whether it was fear, anger, whatever, scared. But then at the end of each Psalms, you would see that he praised the Lord Most High, no matter what. And I think that that is so so beautiful. Our God is so good. Yes. If you want more practical advice too, as a Christian, um, James is a good one too to start at. So hopefully one of those helps you. All right. Well, it's already getting late, you guys. So I'm going to go to bed. Um, but before I go, let me just bless you. Lord, bless your people. May your people get closer and closer to you and want to walk a holy life. I pray that you teach us your ways, that we may know you and find your favor. Lord, give us the wisdom that we need, the understanding that we need. Um, and, and the knowledge that we need to walk this walk that you have predestined for us, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, you guys, have a good night, and hopefully I'll see you guys soon. Bye.